Today we've got the story of Chief Petty Officer John Finn. Finn would be awarded the first Medal of Honor in the Second World War. And that's because his Medal of Honor citation was for actions taken during the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which kicked off the war. So in the morning of December 7, 1941, at 7.48 a.m., Japanese planes began their attack on Pearl Harbor. That morning, John Finn got the word of the attack. Something was amiss. A friend came to his, uh, to his residence and said he was needed down at the airfield immediately. And this is where John Finn's story takes off. Now to back off, to back up a little bit and talk about the attack on Pearl Harbor, this was the, um, the United States entry point into the Second World War. Prior to December 7, 1941, the United States was not at war with Germany. We were not at war with Italy. We were not at war with Japan. There were signs this could be coming. And in fact, Japan, having planned the surprise attack, intended on um, sending over a declaration of a, a notice to the United States that negotiations had ceased, and then shortly thereafter, a declaration of war. That didn't happen. Um, it was the, the timing didn't work out well. So on that morning, the United States was attacked, not understanding yet that they were at war. They, of course, understand pretty quickly. And people like, like John Finn would, would jump into that role as fast as anyone. The attack on Pearl Harbor was designed to stunt the American ability to um, counter Japanese aggression in the Pacific, specifically the Southern Pacific, as they continued their um, expansion of their empire. The thought at the time, the you know, years of planning and a lot of analysis that I'm going to sum up in a few sentences, but the thought at the time was if the Japanese forces could deal a relatively decisive blow against the United States Navy, it would knock us back far enough that we wouldn't be able to counter their aggression, their continued aggression in the region, and it might even cause the United States to say, look, we're not going to go across the Pacific Ocean to fight you in some islands we've never heard of. It was a gamble. And it, it, you know, as we know now, it didn't pay off. But I think in retrospect, it wasn't a crazy gamble to think that the United States hearing that we're going to go to war to fight over Pacific Island, the islands in the Pacific like Midway or Guam or Guadalcanal, I don't know. It, it's a fair risk to take that the American public would say, hold on one second, what are we even doing out there in the first place? That's kind of the risk the Japanese military was taking. They essentially wanted to knock the United States out of the war before the war began. So the attack on Pearl Harbor is designed. It's gonna be a surprise attack to take place the morning of December 7th, 1941. And to do so, the, the Japanese forces bring two aircraft carriers within range of the Hawaiian Islands. So Pearl Harbor sits on the Hawaiian on the southern portion of the Hawaiian island of Oahu. It is the, you know, a little on the northwest side of the island chain. It's not the largest island in the chain, but it was a major U.S. military installation in the Pacific. Kind of the, the it was the hub of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. In turn, a pretty rich target for the Japanese. The Japanese forces to attack Pearl Harbor decide to get within range, as they get within range, move to the north of the Hawaiian Islands, and this is going to be important. So remember, Pearl Harbor sits on the south of Oahu. Japanese forces are positioning their aircraft carriers in the north, and that's where these attack planes are going to come from. The Japanese have made it an incredible distance, uh, successfully not tipping their hand. It, it is the, the attack on the morning of December 7th is truly a surprise. There's warning signs. There's intelligence that maybe we should have picked up. There is a submarine that was caught off the shore of Hawaii. What the heck is a submarine doing? A Japanese submarine being caught in the submarine nets outside Pearl Harbor. What's because in retrospect, we can say you should have been able to piece this together. But on the morning of December 7th, there really wasn't anybody that expected a Japanese attack to take place, especially right then. As the Japanese approached the island, they came from the north. There was radar, there were radar sites, but again, we're not an army at war. So 
the radar picked up the Japanese aircraft, but the radar doesn't have a big number next to it and say, well, this is Japanese or this is American. So the, the, what the radar was picking up was interpreted to be American bombers coming back from some, some practice runs. That of course ended up not being the case. But the result of that is that the first wave of Japanese fighters, dive bombers, bombers, and torpedo boats makes it over, um, makes it over the island into Pearl Harbor prior to 8 a.m. on that morning. So prior to 8 a.m., on a morning when the United States is not at war, they caught everybody off guard. They start wreaking havoc on the American ships. Now, what the Japanese are after in terms of target in terms of their targets also comes into play for the story of John Finn. The Japanese at this point in the war understand a few things are gonna be critical to the power of a naval force. Number one is battleships. And this is, well, there's, there, so I'm, we're gonna go three directions here. Number one is battleships. They're gonna focus heavily on battleships. These were the big main guns, kind of the, the, the big fighters of the sea. So battleships were heavily, Naval doctrine was that the battleships were going to be the ones throwing these knockout punches. And everybody was, all countries were big fans of their battleships. They were um, admired craft. They were, they were cherished. And, you know, rightly so. And the Japanese went after those battleships. Knock out the biggest guns. Knock out their offensive capability. They also went after aircraft carriers. It wasn't known yet at the time. Not really solidified. Pearl Harbor attacks actually going to pretty well um, make this fact. Aircraft carriers end up being the naval, the most important piece of a naval armada in the Second World War. It, without doubt, aircraft carriers, aircraft carriers, aircraft carriers are so important. That wasn't quite drilled home in 1941. Fortunately for the United States, none of our aircraft carriers were at Pearl Harbor that morning. That was an attack objective of the Japanese, but they get over Pearl Harbor, there's no aircraft carrier. So they go down the list and start hitting battleships and cruisers and destroyers instead. The last piece, and we'll get back to John Finn, is they're gonna attack aircraft. The reason the Japanese wanna attack aircraft, although we can churn out aircraft so much faster than we can you know, build a new battleship or an aircraft carrier or even a submarine, but if the Japanese can knock out the American aircraft that are sitting on the ground on Pearl Harbor, it's going to be a free-for-all. So their fighters come in and, and strafe the runways where the American aircraft are lined up and drop bombs and do everything they can to keep American forces from being able to get up in the air and fight them off, then they can just have their pick of which ship to go after next. That's not to say there aren't men on the ground defending, but the fighters coming in, one of their main jobs is make sure that no American fighter planes get up in the sky and can counter our attack. So John Finn moves over to, uh, is called down to his base, Kenawaha, Kenawahi, 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 I think is how you say it. Um, it's on the eastern, I'm butchering that. It's on the eastern side of the island. It's south southeastern kind of but it's north and east of Pearl Harbor. The reason that's important is as the waves come in, they're gonna hit his airfield and the aircraft sitting there before they move down to Pearl Harbor. It's gonna be a target en route, if you will. They're gonna get there pretty quickly. He gets to the airfield and has noticed that, so first off, there's planes destroyed, they're on fire, and his, he's got some guys there. They're um, running to these aircraft, trying to do everything they can to provide some sort of defense. So there, some of them are, are in destroyed and burning aircraft, manning the machine guns, trying to shoot down the Japanese planes flying overhead. Some of them are pulling machine guns out of the burning aircraft. That is what Finn does. He pulls a 50 caliber machine gun, pulls a 50 caliber machine gun, finds a, um, a rolling platform that would be used for, for target practice. So to simulate what it would be like firing from a moving aircraft, a lot of times in training, you would have the gunner on a platform that could be moved around during, uh, during his target practice. So we could understand if you're in an aircraft, you're not just sitting still shooting at the enemy. You're moving, as are they. So this was a training tool. He put the 50 caliber machine gun on this training tool and wheeled it out into the open. He moved it out in the open so he could see more of these enemy fighters coming in. 
but it's a double-edged sword. He can see them, they can see him. So as the Japanese fighters are coming in to strafe the runway, destroy the enemy planes, or as they're coming or going um, from their attack on Pearl Harbor, Chief Petty Officer John Finn is hammering away on his 50 caliber machine gun, providing a substantial amount of anti-aircraft fire in defense of his men, in defense of the airfield, in defense of the aircraft. He stays on the machine gun for two hours. He's wounded 21 separate times. He only comes off the machine gun when somebody orders him to go get medical attention, which he does. He quickly gets treated, quickly gets his wounds taken care of, and comes right back, right back to the airfield where he starts helping to rearm and re-equip the surviving aircraft so they can get in the air and get back into the fight defending the base of Pearl Harbor. That's his original job in the first place is to help with the rearmament, is to help with the armament and oversee that section for naval aircraft. So he had to stray out of his normal job and, and start acting as a machine gunner. Which in fact, when he got to the airfield, there was a, uh, there was a painter that was manning the 50 caliber machine gun and, uh, and Finn pulled him off of it. And later in an interview said, I, I think maybe I was a little more qualified to man a 50 cal than, than a painter was. So anyways, distracted from his duties for a little while so he could get after, um, get after providing defensive fires in support of the American forces but then got right back into re-equipping aircraft, wounded, severely wounded, 21 wounds, re-equipping the American aircraft so they can get up in the air and get back after the fight. This all happened so fast. I mean, the entire attack on Pearl Harbor was an hour and a half. And that, that's two different waves. So that's the aircraft coming, going, coming, going. It's, you know, we look back, there's so much damage, so much devastation, but realistically on the ground, it would have been a, it would have happened incredibly. So for his actions that day, Chief Petty Officer John Finn would be awarded the United States Medal of Honor. He would go on to live to the age of 100, passing away in May 2010 at his home in California. And at the time of his death, Finn was the oldest living Medal of Honor recipient and the oldest living survivor from the attack on Pearl Harbor.